I'm just going to jump into our story. Actually, let me pray for us, and then, then we're just going to jump in, because we've got a long, long passage, and I want to get all of it covered. I think it's important for us. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we ask today that you would teach us from what we read. And we're grateful today for your mercy toward us and your grace that even people like us, you have called your sons and daughters. But we love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis 29.1 says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Remember where he's headed. He's headed to a place called Haran, which is where his, his mother's brother lives, Laban, Jacob's uncle. Remember, he's also on the run from his brother who wants to kill him, Esau. And he makes it, finally. Jacob came to the land of the people of the east. And as he looked, he saw a well in a field. And behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well, the flocks were watered. Now the stone on the well's mouth was large. And when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. So you get the picture. There's a well and they cover it. They keep it covered so nothing gets in there to taint the water. Okay. And so what they do is they wait until all the flocks get there. Then they uncover it, they water the sheep so they can keep an eye on things, Then they put the stone back until the next day. And so Jacob approaches and he says, verse 4, My brothers, where do you come from? And they said, We're from Haran. And he said, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well. And look, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. And he said, Behold, it's still high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered together yet. Water the sheep and then go pasture them. But they said, we can't until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. And then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now, as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And he told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Now, he didn't just like kiss her on the mouth. Like it's not like he assaulted her. He's overwhelmed. He's made this 500 mile journey on foot. Okay, so you can just already, that's incredible. It took him a very long time to get here. He's on the run. He's been away from his family. And now finally he makes it to the place where he was meant to be. And he sees Rachel, who's the first, the first family member that he's seen, his, his cousin. And he runs and he probably kissed her on the cheek and he wept because he's overwhelmed by this moment. And when he told her who, she, who he was, she runs to go and tell her dad. And as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And Jacob told Laban all these things, probably the whole story, or maybe the, the parts of the story that make him look a little bit less shady. And Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? In other words, he's saying, I don't want to take advantage of you just because you're my nephew. I'll pay you. Tell, tell me what you want me to pay you. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. I think that's a nice way of saying Leah was not very attractive. Her eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful, and Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. So normally in those days... Uh, um, a young man would come and his family and he would pay a bride price to the bride's family in order to marry a young girl. Like that was just the custom of the time. Jacob has nothing, but he recognizes that his labor is worth something. And so he says, I'll give you seven years of my work in order to marry your daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give you to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Seven years is a long time, by the way. 
That's a long time. But that's what he wanted to do. He loved her from the moment he saw her and he said, she's the one. I came here to find a wife and she's the one. This is the one I want. So he works for her seven years, but it seemed like a few days. And then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her, which is the biblical way of saying so that we can get married and do married stuff for my time is completed. And so Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast, a wedding feast is the assumption here. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob and he went in to her. And as I re- read this, I think, what, how did that happen? How does that happen? That that is a situation where you accidentally do what you wanted to do with the woman that you loved with her sister who looks nothing like her and who is not even very attractive. And I have to imagine that this feast was not just food, okay? That it was probably lots and lots of strong drink as well and wine. And, you know, as weddings can sometimes be, uh, apparently Jacob got a little out of hand and he had way too much to drink. That's my guess, at least. Or maybe it was just really dark or maybe it was a combination of the two. But regardless... He ends up sleeping with Leah. And so he ends up there for married to Leah. And you think, what in the world is going on here? Why would he do that? Why would Jacob do that? Why would Leah do that? Why would Laban do that? And so he gave her, he gave him Leah. And he also gave Leah her servant, Zilpah, to be her servant. And in the morning, Jacob woke up. Behold, it was Leah. Verse 25. And Jacob said to Laban, What have you done to me? You have deceived me. Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why have you deceived me? And Laban said, Well, you know, we don't, it's not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. And you would think Jacob would say, could you have told me that seven years ago? But no, Laban just deceived him. So now that the, the trickster has been tricked in a sense. And so Laban says, verse 27, complete the week for this one. Because again, part of the tradition, they would essentially have a week long honeymoon. They would be a time where he would not work at all, she would not work at all, and they would just spend time together. And it's supposed to be a time of celebration and young love and all of that good stuff, but it's Leah. And so Laban says, well, complete the week of this one, and then we'll give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. And Jacob did so, and he completed her week, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. And so Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, obviously, and he served Laban for another seven years. Okay. This is the intermission point for the story. We've got this nice romantic story. He comes, he finally makes it to his, his family in Haran, after this huge long journey, he's in a place of safety. He meets Rachel. He falls in love with her. He works for her seven years, but it's as a few days because he loves her so much. And then he gets tricked into marrying her ugly sister. And then her dad's like, well, you can have her too for another seven years. And it's like, oh man, imagine, imagine that. I... So Jacob comes for one woman, and now he has two wives, one of which he doesn't really love. But it gets worse, okay? It gets worse. Just get ready. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. And that's just so sad, goodness gracious. I, I just, I wonder what the conversation looked like between Laban and Leah. Do you think he came to her and he was like, look, you're ugly. No one wants you. Just let me trick this, this young man into marrying you also. And that way you'll at least have a husband and you can have some kids and you won't just die an old spinster. Like I'm, I'm, I just, I don't know what that conversation went like because she agreed to that. Whatever it was, she was like, okay, yeah, I guess you're right, dad. Nobody's ever going to love me. 
And so she goes to Jacob and she wasn't loved. He didn't love her, but at least she was married. And she names her first son Reuben and says, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, now my husband will love me. I gave him a son. Now, now he'll have to love me. And she conceived and bore another son. Verse 33, and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he's given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I've borne him three sons. And therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. And therefore she called his name Judah. And then she ceased bearing. Well, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. And she said to Jacob, give me children or I will die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against her. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Which is the very wrong answer to give, by the way. If your wife comes and says, it's killing me that we don't have any kids. And he says, well, I'm not God. No, Jacob, come on, man. Don't, no. But that's what he said. And then she said, well, here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her that she may have children in my place. And we know how well that works out, right? When we think back to Sarah and Abraham, when she gave Hagar to Abraham to have a son, and that worked out great because then she hated Ishmael and it didn't work out well. And it doesn't work out well here either. So Rachel's, Rachel's servant, Bilhah, conceived, verse 5 of chapter 30, and bore Jacob a son. And then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. And therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's servant, Bilhah, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And then Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So even in naming her own son, she's saying, ha ha, look, now I'm as good as Leah is. And so she called his name Naphtali. And then when Leah saw that she had ceased bearing, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. So now Jacob, who came to Haran for one woman, has four and he only loves one of them. And then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, Good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. And then here it gets even stranger and worse in a way. In the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. And then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said, Is it a small matter that you've taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? You can just, you can feel the bitterness there, right? It's just this constant war between these two sisters who apparently at one point probably loved each other. And then Rachel said, well, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. In other words, give me the vegetables and then you can, you can have sex with our husband tonight. And you're just like, oh, is this where we're at? <laughs> and when Jacob came home from the field in the evening... Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me tonight, for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. And so he lay with her that night, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. And so she called his name Issachar. And I don't, I still don't know if that, that God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband, if she's saying, like, God has judged me in this way, or if she's saying, God has blessed me. And there's no way that God had blessed her for her actions. And I think she just completely misunderstands the situation. But she called his name Issachar. And so you see they're using each other. They're using God. They're using their servants. They're using Jacob. Like it's just a mess. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Verse 20, and Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now, finally, son number six, now my husband will honor me because I've borne him six sons. And so she called his name Zebulun. And afterwards she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. And then finally, it says, verse 22, that God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. And that's where we're going to stop today. Here's, here's the first takeaway. 
I think. The first takeaway is that this is one of this is the most messed up marriage situation that we have in the Bible. And so I think number one is God designed marriage as the lifelong union between one man and one woman. God designed marriage as the lifelong union of one man and one woman. Genesis and other parts of the Old Testament, but especially Genesis, has this habit of presenting something horrible without comment or explanation or rebuke. And it'll just, it'll just describe, here's what happened, and God is just silent. And that's definitely the case here. All this mess with Laban's deceit and Leah's complicity and then Jacob's life that he's forced to live with these two wives and then three wives and then four wives. But he's part of it too, right? He's complicit in the whole mess. And all the while, God just seems silent. And it almost seems like God is blessing them with children in spite of or because of their polygamy and their their multiple marriage that's going on here. And a lot of people have wondered, myself included at one point, that if maybe God is okay with polygamy because of all this that we have in the Old Testament. Like maybe this is an acceptable thing in God's sight. But I don't think that is at all the point that is being made by this story in particular or really of any of the stories that we have of polygamous marriages. In fact, if you know a story of polygamy in the Old Testament that is presented in a mostly positive way, let me know because I haven't found it. Because they're almost exclusively negative. And even though God doesn't come out and say, you should not have married a second wife, they're presented in a way and then with a tone usually that is just unpleasant. And the consequences are outlined pretty clearly And so I just, even though we have this presented here, I think what this does in a sense is really highlight God's design for marriage as it's supposed to be between one man and one woman for a lifetime. Because like, think about Lamech, Lamech, he's the first one we have. He's in Genesis four and he was pretty much just like a straight up villain. Okay. He killed a guy and then he said, if, you know, if Cain's, reproach is sevenfold, then anyone who kills me will be seventyfold. But God didn't promise him that. And he just like rules over these wives and he's just a violent man. He's not good. That's not a good story. And then Abraham and Hagar, which also went pretty terribly. And that's not a straight up polygamy situation, but it's supposed to just be Abraham and Sarah. And that was God's intention. And he was going to bless Sarah with a son, but she just couldn't wait. And so she introduces Hagar into the marriage. And as we know, that went pretty horribly. And now we have Jacob and this whole family disaster. And pretty soon we're going to get to David. And David's polygamy ended up ruining his legacy and almost split his kingdom in half. And then Solomon derailed his life and reign with hundreds of wives, which God specifically said, don't do any of this. And he did it anyway. Hundreds, hundreds of wives. And then we get to the New Testament and we get, I think, even more clarity On this issue. For example, we have Jesus' words in Matthew 19 where he says, Well, Matthew 19, 3 says, Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So the question is about divorce, but here's his answer. Verse 4 He says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And so that's, there's this implication from Jesus that he goes all the way back to the beginning and says, no, no, no. Remember how it was? It was Adam and Eve, and that was it. That was God's intention. God could have given Adam lots of wives if that was what he wanted, but he didn't. He gave him Eve because that was what it was supposed to be. That's what marriage is supposed to look like. The Apostle Paul clarifies this even more in Ephesians 5.31, where he says, therefore, he quotes the same thing. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And and in that metaphor, we, we see this even more clearly. Christ has one church, and the church has one Christ, right? That it's supposed to be... The marriage is this picture of we're playing out the love between the Lord and, and his people, but it's, it's one people and one Christ. It's not that Christ marries each of us individually, but that he marries the church in this metaphorical sense. And then we add that to the qualification for pastors in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, 
that they must be the husband of one wife or a one woman man is the more literal translation. I think probably the more accurate is a one woman man. In other words, that a, a pastor should be a man who is devoted to a single woman, which immediately excludes polygamy. But it also points to something greater, right? That he's supposed to be devoted completely to that one wife. Here's 1 Timothy 3. It says, therefore, an overseer should be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And Titus uses the exact same phrase. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. And you say, well, that's just for pastors. But those qualifications or that, those lists of virtues are not just for pastors. It's a picture of what Christian maturity is supposed to look like. And the only one that is not listed somewhere else or the only one that is not going to be, should, should not be true for every single Christian is able to teach. Right? That's a specific gift that God gives. But the idea that a pastor should have a single, a single wife be married to one woman, devoted to that one woman, is because he's supposed to be an example of what it is to be a Christian. So all that together points to this fact that God's design for marriage is one man and one woman. And whenever that gets messed up and entangled and, and adultery takes place or divorce takes place or polygamy takes place or whatever else kind of mess, then it messes things up. There are consequences. There are, there are fractures in what God has designed. And it's not to say that God can't use people still who have messed up in these ways. Not at all. God forgives everything. God can cleanse us from all kinds of things. But it is to say, here's number two, that sin ruins everything. Sin ruins everything. Sin ruins everything. And here's what I mean. Sin takes what God created and what God designed and mutilates it and mangles it up. Proverbs 14, 12. This is one that should, if you haven't memorized this yet, let me say this. You should memorize this one. This is one that should echo in our minds. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. <clears throat> and I think what the, the author here of this proverb, because what he's doing in the book of Proverbs, or what all these men who are writing the Proverbs, because remember there's several authors of Proverbs, is they're saying this is God's way. Here, If you want to be wise, the beginning of wisdom is the knowledge of God, right? If you want to, if you want to be wise, you got to know God. You got to walk with Him. And so, for Him to say, "There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death," He's not saying the logical, the logical thing to do is the wrong thing to do. That's not what He's saying. What He's saying is, if you figure out a way to do something that is different from what God has said, the end is death, right? If you if you're going to defer to your own wisdom instead of God's wisdom, you'll find death. And this story that we've read today is a story of sin upon sin, really. Right? Laban messed up, Leah messed up, Jacob messed up, Rachel messed up, and the consequences were devastating for this family. Which makes me think also of Romans 6, 20 through 23, where Paul says of us, when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So the end of sin is death. But now you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God. And the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so what Paul sets out before us there in Romans 6 is to say, now that we're free in Christ, for those of us who have put our faith in him, he has set us free from sin. Now we have the choice. We get to choose to keep sinning and die. Or we get to choose to walk in the, in the path that leads to eternal life, which is the righteousness of God. Because even as Christians, we still have the option to sin. We know this, I think. Hopefully you know that. Not hopefully. I'm, I'm certain that you know that if you're a Christian, that sin still lives in you. right? Sin, sin dwells in our members. And yet, God has set before us eternal life. Or he's unshackled us from sin. Now we have to choose. What are we going to do? But here's the truth. Sin still leads to death. Even though we are now in Christ, those of us who have given our lives to him and put our faith and trust in him, even though we belong to him, 
Sin still ruins us. If we still choose sin, we still will find death. We still will find death. Jacob was God's chosen man, right? God came to Jacob in the wilderness at Bethel and made the covenant with him. Showed his mercy to him. And in fairness, in this story, Jacob is probably the least guilty of all. But it says Jacob, he hated Leah. Like That was not okay. You find yourself in this horrible situation. The, the right thing to do is not to make it even worse. This leads to number three. Here's where the, the good news is. Even in the midst of this horrible story, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purposes, okay? God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purposes. Without a peace, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purposes. Because Jacob is still the patriarch. He's still God's chosen man. Jesus still refers to God as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And his sons who were born in the midst of all this mess and who are about to go out and commit sins of their own, as we're going to get to. By the time we get to chapter 40, you're going to have a lost respect for almost all of Jacob's sons, except maybe for Joseph and Benjamin and a few of the others. But this is, these are going to be the men who are the namesakes for the 12 tribes of Israel. And they suck. They're the worst, okay? They're just not good. They're not good. They should be. They're God's guys. They should be holy and righteous. And you would expect, you would expect if the Bible was made up, right? If, the, if Moses wrote the Bible as like this pious lie to try to convince the Israelites that came from this great lineage, which is what some critical scholars will say, you would expect these to be like awesome, legendary, hero kind of figures. And every single one of the patriarchs is, is human, is imperfect, makes horrible choices sometimes, just like all of us. And yet this is the family that God chose to be his people Israel. This messed up family full of sin and flaw are the ones that God picked. And it's not like we can say that God didn't know what they would become. He knew. But as we talked about last week, God is nothing if he is not merciful. And he uses flawed people to accomplish his perfect purposes, which is great news for us. Because we are all flawed people too. And we know this. We are flawed and sinful and broken and tainted and depraved. And we are not who we should be. And we are not worthy of the name of Christ. And yet God loves us and has chosen us to be his people. And he has redeemed us from the curse of sin by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And by faith, he has adopted us into his family and called us his sons and daughters. And he has entrusted us with the ministry of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. It says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to him, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible is full of flawed and sinful characters, and even the good ones have besetting sins, okay? There, there, are, no, there are no perfectly good men in all the Bible. There are no characters that we look at and say, he did everything right. There's not one except for Jesus. And he was God in the flesh, right? He is the foil and the contrast for everyone else. And where we see, we see pieces of Christ, we see aspects of Christ in all these different characters. Christ's perfection highlights the imperfections of everybody else, including us. And when we see Jesus being Jesus, if we're being honest, it brings up something in us where we say, Man, I'm not that. I'm not that. But that shouldn't drive us to despair. It should drive us to humility. Because we need salvation, and salvation has come. And we need patience, and patience has come. And we need to be raised from the dead, and life has come in Jesus. 1 Timothy 1, 15-16. 
The Apostle Paul tells Timothy this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. That's the Apostle Paul. And the reason he said that is because he used to persecute Christians. He persecuted God's church. He went out trying to kill and destroy the church of Jesus. And Jesus found him on the road and kicked him off his horse and and it changed him forever. He said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And when Paul met the risen Christ, everything changed. And, and he gave up everything that he was and everything that he used to be. And God used him mightily in the midst of all of that, despite all of that. And so he, when he says to Timothy, I am the worst sinner, I think he probably means I'm, I'm the worst person that I literally know. But... Verse 16, he says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So here's what I want to leave you with today. Jacob was not perfect at all. He was not, he was not even good, really. He, he gets there. He gets better. He meets God. Things start to change. But he ends up in this broken family situation. And, and if you just, from the outside looking in on Jacob's life, like imagine you're Jacob's neighbor and you know all the drama and you just think, golly, what a God forsaken family that is. But the reality is those were God's people. Those were the ones that he had made the covenant with. And even though they failed in many ways, they were not a perfect family. God still used them to produce the nation of Israel, which he then used to produce the Savior of the world. And if God can use them, God can use us. No matter how failed our lives may seem, no matter what sins we may have in the past, the glorious truth is that God can use us still. And we may face consequences for those sins, right? Jacob's, Jacob doesn't have a lot of peace in his life going forward and his family is still pretty messed up by the time he dies and yet and yet he is the patriarch he is it's the god of abraham and isaac and jacob he's he becomes israel who is the namesake for the whole nation if god can use paul he can use us if god can use any of the people the broken flawed sinful people in all of the bible And he can use us too because Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to set us free from sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we come to God by faith and we ask for his forgiveness by the blood of Jesus, he forgives us and he he washes us clean and he puts Christ's righteousness on us. And we don't ever become that righteousness in this life. You're not going to get there. And if you look in the mirror and you say, look how broken I still am, but I'm trying, God. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. God will use you despite yourself because he's a God of mercy and grace. And he uses imperfect people to accomplish his perfect purposes. And then the day is going to come where we are made perfect again. Jacob now is in the kingdom of God in heaven, righteous, truly righteous, clean and holy, like he should have been in the first place, like all of us should have been. And one day we're going to get to be there too. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for your great love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you for the story of Jacob and his messed up family to remind us that none of us is too far gone. That there is no sin so great that the blood of Jesus cannot wash it away. Lord, we ask that you would continue to set us free from sin, that by your Holy Spirit you would continue to drive sin out of us, to put sin to death in us so that we might become more and more holy and honor you and glorify you as you deserve. But Lord, even as we continue to fall short, we thank you for your grace that covers us completely. We thank you that we are saved by our faith in Christ and not by our good works. Because Lord, we know there's nothing we can do to become worthy or to undo all of our sins, except to trust that Jesus has washed them away by his life and death, and he has defeated death by his resurrection, and that he now sits in heaven and awaits us in glory, where one day we will be with him glorified and whole and clean and holy forever. And we look forward to that day 
And we ask that you would help us to set our eyes on eternity, to walk in your power and your grace and your love, and to not give up, to not give in, but to keep striving to be the people you have called us to be. Lord, we need you. We thank you for your grace. And we love you because you have first loved us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.